Well, good morning and uh, welcome to our service. Thank you for logging in. Thank you for joining us. And um, I pray this morning that you will be both blessed and challenged as we come uh, to worship the living God and as we come to gather around his word. So let's get straight into it again this morning and let's worship the living God together.
Well, here we are again, uh, uh, getting into Mark's Gospel, and um, we're in the uh, final few verses of the first chapter. So uh, let me read those verses for you, and let's get started with this. Mark chapter 1, at verse 40. And a leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling, said to him, If you will, you can make me clean. Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him, and said to him, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. And Jesus sternly charged him and sent him away at once, and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer you for your and offer for your cleansing what Moses commanded for a proof to them. But he went out and began to talk freely about it, and spread the news, so that Jesus could no longer openly enter a town, but was out in desolate places, and people were coming to him from every quarter. This is a, a really interesting section, um, and uh, you know, a typical Mark. Uh, uh, we've not even got out of the first chapter, and we've had um, a, a whole range of things, uh, including Jesus preaching and, and delivering people of demons, and now we're on to a healing of a leper, which of course was one of the messianic signs. It's one of the things that would say to, to people who were observing, here is the Messiah, here are, here are his credentials. He delivers people of demons, he heals the sick, he teaches with authority. And, uh, and it kind of, it, this in this first chapter here, Mark has gone a long way to just kind of build the credibility of Jesus in terms of the things that he does and to reinforce the fact that here we have the Messiah, here is the one, the, the one and only, here is the son of the living God, the Messiah who has come to save us. And so Jesus is approached in these verses by a leper. Um, and um, the leper, of course, is breaking all the rules. He um, uh, is in a difficult place because he is both um, uh, spiritually, religiously unclean and uh, also, uh, you know, he's breaking the rules of the, the day in terms of health and safety um, because it's a very contagious disease and he approaches Jesus. And um, so uh, make what you want. <laughs> that was he being brave? Was he being reckless? Who knows? But he comes to Jesus and, and this is where it gets interesting because he says to Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. And, and um, he is stuck in a little bit of a dilemma here it seems because uh he's saying to jesus i know that you can make me clean i know that you could do this um uh, if you wanted to uh, but the question is do you want to and so he uh, understands something about the power of god and the ability of jesus but he's a little less sure about the mercy and the grace of god and this of course could come from his background um you know in uh, in judaism and the rule book and, and how all of these things work and how people were enslaved very much by those sorts of things but he comes with that uh, mindset and i wonder as you're listening to this now i wonder where you sit with all of that because it seems to me that many of us have very strange ideas um, about who god is and about what god uh, will do what god wants to do uh, and sometimes what God is able to do. Uh, we sit in the middle of very difficult circumstances where we're asking all sorts of questions about what God is doing and what's going on around us. And, and here we have a, a perfect example of one of those kind of dilemmas. You could do this, but do you want to do this? Jesus, of course, says, of course I want to. And we'll come to that in a moment. And, uh, and he heals him. But I wonder where you find yourself in those things. It's very easy when we um, read the stories in, in the, the accounts in, in the scriptures about the life of Jesus and the things that he said and did. It's very easy for us to read those things and come away from it uh, impressed with his power and impressed with the grace that he shows to others, but wondering whether actually he would want to show that grace to me, whether he would want to show me mercy. It's very easy to get in that place where we have faith that God can do things, but we're not sure about whether he wants to do things. And so um, we we must kind of challenge ourselves in this right from the outset and, and ask ourselves, am I, am I having here, am I getting a right view of the scriptures? Am I getting a right balance in terms of what I believe God can do and what he will and wants to do, which is the dilemma 
the, the leper finds. There are all sorts of other dilemmas that, that occur uh, in, in our faith. I've been reading some interesting articles this week um, about the way that uh, particularly in Pentecostal and charismatic circles, there has been a, a a slow kind of decline in what we would describe as biblicity. In other words, that instead of actually looking at the scriptures and understanding what the scriptures say and, and making proper sense of them and finding proper balance in them, there's been a shift in, in, in different ways to things which are becoming less biblical and instead of for instance instead of um you know years and years ago um if we were going to preach the gospel um we would uh, be saying to people you are a sinner you you have sinned you have offended god therefore come to god and receive his forgiveness and his grace and get yourself into a relationship with him that would be very much the the foundation of our gospel in many places now we hear people um, on on the tv and in churches telling us how awesome we are how wonderful we are how great we are and um and how much god really loves us um, all of which uh, at one level is completely true but it then starts to kind of remove the need for repentance it then starts to remove the need for any uh, kind of committed uh, progress towards god and dealing with issues in our lives because if i'm awesome and god just loves me then clearly there's nothing i need to do about that so you can see that in these modern times we face a lot of uh, questions and we face um, a lot of challenges in terms of finding a proper biblicity, finding a proper theological understanding of, of both who God is in terms of his power and his ability and also what God wants to do in our lives and how he wants to touch us and bless us and his willingness and his availability to do that. And uh, we see some of the answer to that in these verses we will see more of the answers to that as we go through this gospel but in these verses in particular we see that Jesus not only can heal but he has a heart to heal he is moved and I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce the Greek word there but he is moved by pity or compassion as he sees this leper as he sees the faith that the leper does has does have in Jesus' ability to heal, uh, Jesus just wants to show him uh, love and mercy and grace, and he reaches out and heals the leper. And uh, so you see there the, the great balance between, yes, he has the power, yes, he also has the ability. But I like the uh, humility in which the leper comes to him. There's no, you know, your God, you should grow, show grace, heal me or your God, you're all powerful, you should heal me, and if you don't, you can't be powerful. There's none of that kind of nonsense going on, but he just comes in humility and asks to be healed, and Jesus, out of his grace and his mercy, uh, extends a hand towards him and heals him, and the guy is cleaned of his leprosy, and again, he's re reinforcing this whole um, sign issue of Jesus being the Messiah. The, mess the messianic signs are all there. This also, of course, raises uh, a question for us in, in terms of when we pray for people to be healed, why doesn't everybody get healed? Uh, because, um, you know, from my own experience, I've been praying for people who are sick um, almost since I got saved, which, which is a, a long uh, time ago now, uh, 44 years ago. And um, in, in, uh, in all of that time, um, I must have prayed for hundreds and hundreds of people who were sick and, and needed some help from God. And sometimes I've seen God do wonderful, miraculous things. I've seen people healed. Uh, and other times I've prayed for people and the situation has continued. And, and it, it gets very difficult to kind of discern sometimes what is going on. Well, I think there are some things that are plainly evident as we read the scriptures that we must kind of register first and foremost. So that is, first of all, that for healing to take place, faith must be present. So the leper comes to Jesus in the faith that Jesus can heal him. Um, and uh, you, you find very often Jesus, when people are healed, he says to them, your faith has made you well. You find that, that phrase quite often in the Gospels. And it is clear to me that faith is uh, necessary. It needs to be present in order for healing to take place. And that sometimes um, uh, is on the part of the person coming for healing. That sometimes is on the part of the person praying. But faith must always be present. And I never find Jesus criticising somebody because of their uh, lack of faith when it comes to healing. Uh, people can come and, and, and not have faith um, and get healed. 
likewise people can come full of faith when we're praying and not get healed and so uh, you know this is we it all gets very difficult and very confusing sometimes but clearly faith is one of the elements that must be present if healing is to take place i think from what we read in these verses it's quite clear that compassion must be evident as well and i very often wonder how many uh, you know times how many occurrences there are when people pray for the sick and actually it's not out of compassion it's not out of a place of uh, of love in that sense uh, maybe it's to get a notch on our belt oh i'll pray for this person to get healed and if they get healed that's a notch on my belt i can kind of give myself a a badge a pat on the back i can take a step up uh, you know in my stature as a christian that kind of thing uh, maybe uh, we see it as an endorsement of a ministry or something that you know god has called me to minister therefore if i pray for somebody who's sick and they get healed then my ministry is being endorsed by god and people will pay attention actually the the bible has non of that the bible really has none of that that praying for the sick should come from a heart of compassion and a desire for the well-being of the person that you are praying for so faith needs to be present compassion needs to be present and i think also for us there needs to be an element of expectation um, that I, I when i come to pray for somebody who is sick i have to kind of talk to myself so that i come expectant that god will heal uh, and so uh, faith expressing itself in expectation that God will come and do something. And, uh, and if he doesn't do something, then I come back again and I pray with expectation that, you know, this time, this is the time that God will come and do something. And I need to keep praying in that place of faith and expectation from a position of compassion. Still, though, um, some people don't get healed and it is difficult. It is difficult to understand sometimes what God is doing because we believe that he has the power to heal, but it's quite clear that he doesn't always heal. And you might say, well, that didn't happen in the ministry of Jesus, which is not quite true. Um, so I think particularly about the pool of Bethsaida, that Jesus crosses a room full of sick and crippled people to get to one person. He heals that one person and then he leaves. And that throws up all sorts of questions about healing. Uh, we also uh, read, um, for instance, in, Ma in Matthew 13 at verse 58, it says this, and he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. And, and clearly there are times when Jesus didn't do as much as he might have done because there wasn't faith present, because people weren't believing, because people had critical hearts, because people didn't have uh, faith, didn't accept who Jesus was was and therefore didn't trust that he that he could and would heal so there can be um, any number of of things here that, that are going on that make this whole area difficult and we have to ask what what is it that we need to learn through this well the thing that i learned through this is this that i need to keep one eye on eternity because if I'm talking about healing, and I'm talking about healing in the, the widest sense, the best possible healing that I can have is to go and be with Jesus, uh, to, to transition from this life into the next and to spend eternity with Jesus where, you know, all of the things that we dream of in terms of healing and restoration and life and everything else, all of those things come into being. It's unpolluted, it's, it's uncorrupt, it's pure, it's holy, it's eternal, it's wonderful. And there can't be anything better than that. And um, our bodies, for all of us, our bodies are, are decaying. That's the nature of this world and this life. That will not happen in the next life. But at some point, my decaying body in this life is going to give up and I'm going to transition into the next life. Um, and, uh, you know, we must not be afraid. We must not draw back from the idea that actually uh, death for the Christian is not a defeat. The death for the Christian is part of the victory of Jesus. It's the transition into the life that he has promised and is, and is keeping for us in eternity for us to join him and enjoy all of the benefits of our faith, the faith that we hold in this life. So gee, the best healing ever is to be with Jesus. Um, uh, my mother, as some of you will know, uh, died from dementia, the best possible healing for her was to go and be with Jesus and she now is with him in eternity and uh, and is as whole as it is possible to be my father as many of you know um, died of cancer the best healing that he could have possibly had was to go 
<coughs> excuse me, and be with Jesus. And he now lives in complete health and wholeness, a health that he was never going to see in this life because of the corrupt nature of this world. Um, but he lives in that now with Jesus and, and hallelujah that they, you know, they are both there. My mom's there, my dad's there, uh, that I have other relatives who are there and there is no better healing than that. And so when we um, face uh, difficulties in this life in the whole area of healing, we must not be afraid to fall back on that thought that actually the best healing anybody could ever have is to be with Jesus. And that if he hasn't chosen to heal me straight away in this life and do everything that I, that I would like him to do, there is very likely a reason for that. And who knows what that reason is? Who knows what God is working in us and through us? Um, you know, who knows? Uh, but sometimes it's quite clear people do get healed and sometimes it's quite clear people don't get healed. We must not allow that to undermine our faith in both God's ability and his will to uh, bless us and to do us good in this life. And then we get that um, interesting little bit where Jesus, having healed the leper, tells him to go, you know, go away now. Uh, go and make your offering uh, as, as Moses commanded in, in Thanksgiving. Um, and don't tell anybody. And um, Mark's um, secret Messiah kind of rises up again here. Jesus doesn't want this healed man to go telling everybody who healed him. He wants to go to the, he wants him to go to the temple and give thanks to God, give thanks for his healing, and uh, and then to be quiet, to go and live a, a, a life well and whole because he has been healed. And again, what? Why is Jesus doing this? Well, actually, the evidence is in the following verses that because the leper is disobedient, because he goes away and he starts telling everybody what has happened, everybody wants to get to Jesus. And, and Jesus then can only hold his uh, uh, meetings uh, and his services, whatever you'd like to call them, in, in isolated places where people have to come in their crowds to him because he can't enter a town or a city because there's not space, there's not room, there's too many people. And so... Um, Jesus clearly here has his focus on one thing and uh, the leper kind of undermines that a bit by going away and being disobedient and telling everybody what Jesus has done. Now, for you and I, I want to ask the question, um, you know, why it is we want to um, boast about the things that God has done. Now, th there is for sure a boasting in the Lord, which is entirely appropriate and good and we should engage in and we should be um, you know, speaking out the things that God has done. I want to suggest that we should be very careful with that, that our motivation is right. That if we are, if our motivation for, for celebrating what God has done is purely to try and add numbers to the church, then I think we've missed something. If it's to big us up and give us a greater street cred and, uh, and to spread our fame, then I think we've missed something. So I think there's just, there is a cautionary uh, note there not just in the fact that it made Jesus life difficult in terms of his ministry but that also for us um, we want to celebrate what God has done and I'm going to come to that in a moment we want to celebrate what God has done but we must be careful that our motivation is right that we're doing it from a right heart and that we certainly don't want to be quiet about miracles and the magnificent things that God does but we also need to think carefully about why and how we are promoting those things and talking about them. So let that one just settle and let's examine ourselves when we talk about these things. There's also a, a, a thought here about um, what type of healing uh, and um, when we read about healing in the Gospels, um, is it all physical healing? Because actually uh, we have, we find the word healing um, a total of let me just add it up 69 times through the gospels 69 times we find the word healing um, but uh, 26 of those times it's not necessarily physical healing that it's talking about it's 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 more towards a spiritual healing a spiritual wholeness and again we need to understand that there is a balance here when we come to consider healing that actually healing is not just about being physically well it's about being spiritually and emotionally well as well so uh, physically well in, in terms of illness and disease emotionally well in terms of our, our mental health and well-being but also spiritually well spiritually well in terms of being restored in relationship 
to God in, in responding to the gospel, in meeting with Jesus, in having relationship with him and being spiritually well as well. And I think that if you look at it on balance, the gospel actually pushes all of those things almost in equal uh, amounts that actually God uh, wants us to be physically well. He wants us to be emotionally well. He wants us to be spiritually well. And sometimes for us, those things are a bit of a journey, but we need to understand that Jesus comes to do all of those things. And it's not always necessarily about uh, the physical. And it's not always, a phys the physical healing is not always the priority. And when we think about the cross particularly, you know, we, we uh, remember Isaiah, by his stripes we are healed. And again, healing there is much more to do with spiritual healing, not physical healing. That actually, if you look at the language, if you look at the Hebrew, it leads us much more towards the thought of the cross being about spiritual healing and, and reuniting us with God and, and uh, restoring that relationship that we should have with him. It's much more about that than anything else. And so we need to make sure, again, as we're looking at these things, that we find the right place of balance with them. And the final thing today from, uh, from these verses is this. The leper is sent away with the clear instructions that he must go and, uh, and make the offering that Moses commanded. Now, every, there, there was all kinds of offerings uh, that were uh, laid out in the kind of the, the rules and regulations for, for Judaism, that every time uh, God did something for you, you, you gave an offering. Um, so, for instance, our, our tithing, our financial giving would come under that realm that actually uh, it, it, out of gratitude for what God has done for us we give out of the money that he's given us if God has blessed us with money we bless him back and the Bible sets some guidelines for that it talks about 10% uh, let me tell you for those of you who are thinking in those terms this is not just about earned income this is about anything you know that anything that we have coming in you know we should uh, whatever our profit is in that sense should be uh, should uh, there should be an offering given to God in thanksgiving in gratitude for what God has done for us uh, there are also all sorts of rules and regulations when it comes to harvest about how much you give of a harvest there are, are regulations about healing and being blessed in all sorts of ways that if God does something for us uh, that that in Judaism there was a system of here is how you give thanks for that and so Jesus, and um, before you want to write that all off as Old Testament rules and regulations, Jesus tells the leper, you must go and show the appropriate thanksgiving. You must go and make the appropriate offering and show thanksgiving for what God has done for you. And here is the challenge for us. that Are we thankful? Do we express our gratitude to God for the things that he has done for us? Now, uh, it might be that you've never been sick and needed prayer and uh, and therefore you've not been healed. Well, that might be true for some of us. And, uh, you know, you've had a, a, a great life if you've never been sick and never needed prayer. But if that's the case for you, um, that's that's fine. But God has done so many other things for your life. I'm thankful every day that there is food on my table. I'm thankful every day that God has given me a, a wonderful wife. I'm thankful every day for my children and for the partners that my children have found in life and for my grandchildren. I'm thankful every day that I'm able to pay my bills. I'm thankful every day that I have friends and, and uh, people who, uh, who enrich my life. I'm thankful every day for uh, my health, my ability to walk and talk and, and do all of the things that I can do. I'm, I'm thankful for these things and so should you be. We should be thankful for everything that God has given us and everything that God has done for us. And I want to, to suggest this morning that thankfulness is something more than just something we should hold in our hearts because if we truly hold it in our hearts, there should be some uh, kind of practical expression of that. There should be some practical expression of our thankfulness. If we are thankful for the fact that God has put money in our bank, then our thankfulness should be expressed through our giving financially. If we're thankful for the fact that God has put food on our table, then we sh our, our thankfulness should be expressed through sharing our food, through sharing it by having others around for dinner, which don't do that until this lockdown and everything is lifted. Uh, obey the rules. I'm not suggesting you do anything different right in this moment. But 
as a general principle in life. We should share whatever is on our table with other people. We should be giving to the food bank. We should be thinking about the hungry and the homeless. If, you know, if God has blessed us in any way, there should be some outworking of that in terms of gratitude and thankfulness to him. If God has healed us, there should be a display of gratitude. If God has spoken to us and spoken direction in our lives, there should be a display of gratitude. We should live from thankful hearts which find practical expression of gratitude and thankfulness to God for who he is and for all of the things that he's done in our lives. You know, sometimes it's just not enough to say thank you, even if you're genuinely thankful. Sometimes it's just not enough to think those thoughts. Uh, sometimes it's just not enough to say God has been good to me. There is, for very good reason, in, in, in the whole uh, Judaistic structure, there is a system of thanksgiving, of expressing thanksgiving. And we cannot ignore that, that if we're genuinely thankful to God, that uh, that thanksgiving should find its expression somehow or another, to, uh, 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 us giving back something of what God has given to us. Sometimes giving it to God, in other words, um, giving it to the church and letting the church be the administrators of whatever that is. Sometimes, you know, as God uh, stirs us and moves us, picking out particular people that we would want to help and bless and encourage in some particular way. Uh, there are all sorts of ways that that can manifest itself. The important thing is this thankfulness, this gratitude should manifest itself somehow, somewhere in us giving back from what God has given to us. So let me leave you with that challenge this morning, that as we consider God's power, God's mercy, God's faithfulness and the ways that we have um, benefited from that in our lives when we consider all the good things that God has done for us the way that he has healed our spirits and our souls the way that he is the, the way that he has for many of us healed our bodies the way that he is for many of us still healing our bodies for that which we have had and for that which is to come we need to find that place of thankfulness and gratitude and find ways of expressing that uh, in order that God is honoured and that he is blessed and that he is the one who gets the glory for all of the good things that are going on in our lives. Let me leave you with that challenge and God bless you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Well, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for logging in. In a moment, I'm going to pray to close this time together. Let me encourage you again, start typing now. Uh, your prayers and your thanksgiving <clears throat> to God. Uh, start typing it in the comments and then when I come to pray, press go so that it starts appearing in the feed and all of our prayers to God can uh, can rise up together. So uh, remember, uh, you know, people that we're praying for, people who are sick, people who are in need, people who are struggling in these difficult times, let's remember to, to be praying and lifting their names up. Um, not too much personal information, please, because remember, this is going out to the whole world and um, please uh, let's, you know, let's give thanks for all that God is doing. Let's express that thankfulness that we've just been thinking about from Mark's gospel. Uh, remember, of course, uh, stay safe, keep following the guidelines, keep doing what we're told to do. Uh, I'm living in the hope that some of these restrictions might be eased uh, very soon, but we don't know for certain that just yet. But it's important for us that we keep um, uh, obeying what we're being told and, uh, and behaving ourselves in that sense. Remember to stay connected. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. There will be our Facebook Live following this service for our, our kind of coffee time and, and catch up on Facebook Live. Um, next Tuesday, as normal, there will be our Zoom meeting. Please try and get to that. Uh, it's really helpful to kind of see everybody and hear everybody's voice, see how you're all doing uh, and um, a great place for us just to catch up and um, see what's going on uh, with church members um, so please join us for the zoom meeting on tuesday and on thursday night of course we have another facebook live where we will be having our life group uh, sessions a little bit of inspiration and again an opportunity to just send messages and, and uh, respond to one another um, don't forget also uh, pastor pete's um, story time for children is on Facebook Live every Thursday and Friday at 11 a.m. Please uh, log on to those if you have if you have little ones, and uh, I'm sure that they will love that. Uh, Pastor Pete will be there with Nipper, um, and if you don't know who Nipper is, you need to tune in and find out. So don't miss that. And um, 
just do whatever it, you can do to connect and stay connected and, and, and uh, you know, be a part of what we're doing as church in these uh, difficult times. Uh, and the third part of our mantra, stay safe, stay connected, be at peace. Be at peace. Do not fear because God is with us. God is helping us. And we may not see that or understand that sometimes, but let me assure you, God is here. God is helping us. So be at peace. Don't strive. Don't worry. Uh, don't fret. Um, don't don't get hassled by anything that's going on, but just keep looking to Jesus and stay in that place of peace and rest and let the peace of God rest in your heart. So I'm going to pray now uh, God's blessing on you and, uh, and give him thanks. And uh, as I do that, press go and let's see those prayers uh, rising up to Jesus. So let's pray. Father, I thank you. Uh, Lord, for the things that we've learned this morning as we've gathered around your word, I thank you that you are a good God, that you are a powerful God, and that those two things come together in blessing, that actually in your uh, love and your mercy and in your great power and authority, you look for ways to bless us and to help us, to encourage us, to provide for us. And I thank you, Lord, that you do all of those things for us. Help us, Lord, to understand how to turn our gratitude into action, how to turn our gratitude into a heartfelt offering to you that will bless you and bless others as we proclaim your goodness with thanksgiving and gratitude in our hearts. And now I pray that the Lord would bless you, that he in these times would really bless you. To, to be blessed means to be made happy. And I pray that in, in, in some way over these coming days, God would do something for you and in you that would just cause you to be happy, that would cause you to be blessed. I pray that he would bless you and keep you, keep you safe, keep you strong, keep you focused, keep you motivated, keep you on the path, uh, keep you uh, in relationship with him. There are you where you will find life and strength and peace. I pray that he would keep you. I pray that he would draw close to you, that he would be gracious to you, that he would show you his favour, that you would get more than you deserve. In fact, that you would get the things that you don't deserve, that God would bless you with many, many good things. And I pray that above all things, you would be filled with the wonderful supernatural peace that can only come from the living God. I pray that he fills you with his peace in your heart and your mind, in your soul, in your spirit, that you would live in a place of rest because you know for certain that the hand of the living God is upon you and that he will do you good. I pray you be blessed in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Great seeing you. Thanks for logging in and um, see you now over on Facebook Live. God bless you.